Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the MPF webinar for the month of October. We're going to be talking about profitability, and we've got uh, Rob Mattern and Bill Meck going to be joining us uh, for our conversation this afternoon. Rob, how you doing? I'm doing excellent, John. How, how are you doing? I'm hanging in there. How's the weather? You're in the Philadelphia area, I believe. I tell you, uh, got a bit of fall in the air. So it's supposed to be back up to the 70s this weekend. How did you make out with the um, all the um, hurricanes? <laughs> well, uh, it was it's been an interesting couple of weeks. I got a place down in Florida, and they've been somewhat impacted. And my family, you know, they're in St. Lucie okay. where those tornadoes oh, okay. went out of the the bands uh, of uh, Milton, and really caused a lot of destruction beyond the main the main storm. But uh, yeah, we got a taste of fall here in Atlanta as well, and it's nice because it's been a very warm late summer, early fall. Bill Mack, how are you doing, my friend? Fantastic, fantastic. Great to be back. Thanks for well, having me. It's nice to have you back. Where sit you today? In Chicago. Had to bring in a hibiscus because we hit 35 this morning. So wow. for the first time this year. I know. So, so wife... the hibiscus comes indoors for the for the um, winter? They must, yeah. Either that or they're they're gone. Yeah. Fifty degrees and, is their their tolerance. Yeah. And and does it survive the winter? You can take it back out in the springtime? It does. It does. I, I have I, I wouldn't say I have a green thumb, but I, I nurse them along. But as soon as you can get them back outside, they they take off again. So you're good. yeah, they're they're pretty resilient plants. And uh, I grew up in South Florida, where if it gets anywhere near 40 degrees, everything dies, you know, so you know, yeah. it's a very tropical kind of thing. Uh, the iguanas freeze up in the trees and fall down. That's an interesting phenomenon down there. But uh, really great to have you guys with us. And profitability is one of those topics that people really tune into uh, and that and compensation models. And uh, uh, so uh, hopefully Bill and, and uh, Rob and I will dispense some good practical guidance uh, as we look to year end and budgeting for the coming year. Uh, our friend Uri Gutfreund, normally our co-moderator, unfortunately is unable to be with us today, but extends his uh, best wishes to everyone. So uh, we'll get started very, very shortly at the top of the hour. And we've got about 100 and 115 or so uh, managing partners, firm leaders registered for today. So uh, we'll get started very, very shortly. Uh, Bill, anything you want to say before we uh, get started to the formal part of our program? Um, no, I think we have a, a couple of choice comments um, prepared for everybody to hopefully give them some takeaways. But, um, you know, I think we're, we're, we are yet again sort of at an interesting transition point in the industry right where in in one respect a lot of it's the same old same old but a lot of the you know the environments in which we work continue to change in dramatic ways and so we're all trying to figure out how those things you know come in compensation yeah. real estate costs all these types of things staffing levels hybrid workplaces i mean it just it sort of never ends and so it, it's never a dull moment you know. Yeah, COVID certainly thrust some things upon the legal profession uh, in terms of remote work and, and the RTO. We'll talk a little bit about that during our program today. And, um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, AI is really on the minds of a lot of law firm managing partners. I'm not sure they're sure what to do with it quite yet. Everybody's kind of watching and, and, uh, and, you know, but that's a that's a big issue. Rob, anything you want to ch chime in on before we uh, get started? Yeah, I would just say that COVID really, as terrible as it was, I think in a lot of ways it was a big uh, kick in the pants for a lot of firms to get moving towards a digital environment. Um, you know, learning how to manage a hybrid envi uh, environment in regards to uh, the whole remote work. And, you know, I, Bill and I, talked about this extensively about whether that is toothpaste out of the tube and not coming back or you know bill seems to take the other uh side of this and thinks it will come back uh but be more geographically based um and across the board but no i i think again terrible situation no doubt about it but i think it, it was a, a real eye-opener 
for the legal community. Well, we were forced to accommodate. Yeah, exactly. So now getting people back to the office, that's not a forced decision necessarily. And, and you know, folks got used to and many enjoyed working remotely. So we'll get into all these conversations. Let's uh, get for, started. Everyone, welcome uh, to our 53rd uh, of the webinar series that we've been doing since COVID did hit. and We all look for something to do. Hard to believe we've done 54, 53 of these. And uh, Rob, welcome. Bill, welcome. You've done a couple of these before with us and uh, delighted to have you back. I, I mentioned earlier, Uri Gutfreund, our t normal co-moderator, unfortunately not with us today. So I'm going to be shouldering the responsibilities of uh, monitoring our conversation. Rob Mattern. Uh, Rob is the president founder of Mattern and Associates. He'll tell us a little bit about his company, what it does. And Bill Meck. Bill, uh, Bill I meant to update your, uh, your profile there. Uh, former COO at Goldberg Cohn and now principal at Of Partner. So, uh, Rob, why don't you, you know, I'm working from the uh, non-updated deck here, unfortunately, but tell us first about, ooh, I'm going to have to change decks. Bear with me, everybody. Let me shut that one down. We've been editing our deck quite a bit, and uh, here we get started, and uh, I'm working off the wrong one, so bear with me, folks. Hey, John, why don't I take take this moment and I, I just explain what Mattern does? Please do. Okay, we um, we are unbiased consultants for law firms, office and administrative services, records and information governance. Okay, we also do a lot of work and a lot of firms know us for uh, our work in cost recovery. We do surveys and really try to get a grip on the marketplace and help our clients improve that. Um, but really, when I say unbiased, we do not sell any of the services like outsourcing or anything like that. We strictly sit on the firm side and perform a unbiased assessment, utilizing our benchmarks on expenses, administrative services, the contracts that support uh, the back office, um, the whole information governance. We create policies, help firms implement them, and then um, really helping the firms um, get their offsite record storage contracts in shape so you can uh, implement your policy in a cost-effective way. So totally unbiased, sit on the firm side. We um, don't work on a percentage of savings or anything like that. We are uh, fee-based and uh, many of the times or most of the times, the selected vendors reimburse our fee to the firm. So, and Rob, tell us a little bit about what you're doing these days. Um, well, I recently left Goldberg Cone um, and um, I, I guess I would categorize myself as semi-retired, but I've always had a, a small consulting practice on the side. Rob and I have done a number of projects together and um, generally offering analytic services to law firms. But uh, at the moment, we're building a house in Georgia and we're going to be moving down there. So I have we to talk about that. You're in St. Uh, whereabouts in Georgia? St. Mary's. Yeah, St. Mary's, just just north of Fernandino Beach. Beautiful uh, part of uh beautiful part of the state and I think a hidden, you know, on a little bit off the beaten track. Great. Um, so here's Mattern. I finally got our right deck uh, in front of us. Thanks for uh, telling us a little bit about what you do. Our programs for the balance of the year, we do our webinar series. We'll carry one out in November, December. December, we always do our year end. Uh, Uri and I get a, get our New Year's Eve hats on and present a little year end program. It's a lot of fun, kind of highlights uh, of topics we covered through the year. Uh, we get our newsletter out there most Friday mornings. And if you come to one of our programs, we'll sign you up to our listserv and Zoom calls. Uh, people love those. It's an opportunity for managing partners to mix, mingle, share, meet, learn with from each other, not easy leading lawyers. We were talking about some of the fundamental changes hitting the profession with artificial intelligence and remote work. And we got a lot of stuff on our website. Um, one last shameless plug, we'll get started. We have just launched an AI community. And it's for managing partners at smaller and mid-sized law firms. And our intent here is to give you a resource among people you know, people you trust, as to how they're integrating AI into their law firms, if at all. And we're going to do Zoom calls, separate webinars specific to this topic. 
and a listserv to help managing partners be well equipped uh, for what's coming at us. I think we're still in the infancy, in the very early adoption stages. Uh, it's interesting to see the ABA and a couple of state bars rendering ethics opinions. Uh, we're trying to help save you a lot of time and really leap ahead of your competitors uh, in a very safe and trusted environment. So check that out. Uh, we'll certainly include information about it in our follow-up to today's program. We've got 115 managing partners, law firm leaders with us today. Uh, as usual, we'll ask our, uh, we'll present some survey data. Uh, this is all recorded. We'll send it, the link to that recording with some handouts uh, following up on today's session. Uh, what we ask from you is your feedback on the program. Really important to us. What do you like? What didn't you like? Uh, topics for future programs. Tell us what you want. We'll do our best to deliver it. Uh, we love to throw the polling questions at you. Here's the first one, and this is mostly for the benefit of Rob and Bill to give them a sense of firm sizes represented on today's call. And you can see those results flowing in. Uh, I'm showing about 75 people with us. Um, and there's the distribution of firm sizes. We we hit squarely mid-law and really try to provide programming that's timely and relevant to the leaders of smaller and mid-sized law firms. Here are the results for the audience here uh, as to our firm sizes. So uh, let me close that. I got to move some equipment around here uh, just to make sure we're uh, working the technology. They changed our interface on uh, this particular program. We use GoToWebinar, so mm, I'm still getting, uh, getting familiar with it. Bringing on the data when you're registered. We asked about intentions for rate increases in 2025. Rob, what do you think of that? Any surprises to that? Uh, I tell you a couple of things. One, the the nine percent with the ten plus percent increase after a couple of years of big increases out there. Um, God bless you. You know what I'm saying? If you got the, uh, I think that's a reach. A huh? uh, I tell you, hey, if you're doing great work, okay, and uh, you're getting the results, no reason why you shouldn't ask for it. But I think that four to five percent with one third of the firms there. Um, I'm a little surprised that 29% are still trying to figure that out, or they're probably pretty close to where they should be. So They should be. Yeah. Um, and hopefully this this program might help them out in terms of thinking that through and what they want to push out to clients. Uh, Bill, what do you think? Any surprises to this data we see? Um, yeah, obviously I share some of Rob's views. I, it's interesting to me that 60% are north of four percent, you know, four percent or greater. Um, so that's a that's a very very healthy number. Um, and obviously the folks who are either flat, the eight percent group, obviously they're sort of in a cost of living mode, right? You're just trying to pursue a cost of living increase year over year, which is absolutely fantastic, better than nothing. So that's a, it's certainly, um, but there are folks. And, and one caveat, Rob, about the eight eight percent or nine percent if that's a live number just changed um they are uh, a, a lot of these numbers are going to be practice specific or practice driven yes definitely. so certainly like some of the transact yeah some of the transactional practices have more opportunities i think to pursue some of those um higher rates or higher increases at least and so that's a caveat to all of these numbers but it's good to see as a whole what's going on out there in the market the yeah. one comment for the bottom echelon here that the 29 percent is you know if you've been sort of following this um as rob is noting over the last several years firms have found opportunities to pursue some pretty aggressive rate increases yeah and there's nobody really knows exactly yet but it feels as though that worm is turning okay that that window of the for those sorts of more dramatic increases is closing so this year where people are pursuing those that's great maybe they'll get less they'll realize less than they did previously but they're going for them so that's great but for those of you who have been on the fence about it or think i can wait another year or two and maybe i can i don't think that's going to happen or there's a, a strong likelihood it's not so time is of the essence for those yep. of you who are pondering that i think 
we, we've asked this question several times, you know, since COVID, there has been aggressive rate setting. Uh, we asked this in New York, uh, Uri and I did our program there and very similar numbers. Uh, firms may have missed a window. Last year was the year, I think, to really, to, inflation was set in, people were expecting it. Uh, but uh, if you're not asking for it, you won't get it. And we encourage aggressive rate setting. Rob, you wanted to? Yeah, John, uh, what, what impact do you think the election is having? Ooh, interesting question. Uh, what do, I think uncertainty, uh, and maybe that's why we see so many not yet sure. We, we want to get this election cycle behind us and then maybe visit how aggressive we want to set rates. Uh, that's an interesting question and one I really haven't thought that hard about. I'll kick it back to you. What do you think, Rob? I think there is that 29%, that could be a reason why it is so high. Um, that it, um, I think there's a general, I don't want to say uneasiness, but uh, trepidation in the marketplace. I, I'm not just talking about legal. I, yeah. I think overall, I think it's, People are generally um, concerned, or probably that's too strong a word, aware of, um, hey, what's going to happen in November? And uh, kind of sitting yeah. there and wait. Well, Bill Mack, I mean, what do you think? Yeah, Bill, what do you think? And then we'll yeah, uh, push through I'm these not, uh, opening slides and get going. <laughs> I'm not really sure. Um, the I, I personally would not really put a strong correlation on it because in the back of my mind, I just would tell myself that your firm's goals are your firm's goals. And if you have certain expectations for the coming year for profitability targets and whatnot, you need to pursue them. And economies are going to change. Cycles are going to come and go. I mean, it's, things are going to happen and you can't predict them, but you should still be out there setting those expectations and trying to attain them. That's that's so my read yeah, I think uh, hopefully the, this, if you're still thinking about it, this might give you a little uh, bit to work with if you've got reluctant partners, you know, who might want not want to be particularly assertive. Uh, this is good data that may persuade some folks, but we're seeing consistently 4 to 5%, 4 to 5%, and, you know, often more uh, higher than 10% of firms going after 10% or more. And here speaks to how frequently you uh, pursue the rate increases. And uh, 80% say we do it on a regular basis, often annually. Sometimes we're locked into a contract for a couple of years, you know, with certain clients. Uh, but uh, Rob, what advice on the uh, frequency with which you look at rates and pursue increases might you offer? I, I think it's mid-sized firms. Yeah, I tell you. Um, well, first of all, I think 80% with a regular increase, great to see. Yep. Okay. Uh, the 18% that says they not as often as they should. Uh, there's no reason why you can't change unless you are locked into uh, multi-year agreements. <clears throat> but what we're starting to do is introducing a prevailing rate. So our rates do change every year. And even of multi-year agreement, we, we make sure we cover that. Um, Interesting. So what do you think? Yeah. And actually, to that point about prevailing rates, I mean, and I, and I know John agrees with this, is that firms manage their rates in different ways. But regardless of what you do, you should have a standard, a standard rate and a standard rack rate for all of your timekeepers. And that's what we're talking about here, that re review of that standard and the regular progression of it. And, you know, the previous slide addresses the degrees in which you want to change it. But basically, this is the effort of doing it. If you're in the 18 percent, you should take this slide and show it to your partners because they need to see what most firms are doing and they're taking action on a regular basis to increase rates probably the most it's one of the reasons we put it as a topic here is i think it's one of the most one of the most common barriers to firms attaining either regular increases in profitability or what their whatever their profitability goals are this is one of the biggest barriers it just is you know, t hours times rate, <laughs> it pretty much brings us to our top line. And we'll talk about realization, how important that is, and being aggressive on your rate setting. Uh, I agree with you, Bill. A standard hourly rate schedule, 
Uh, you can't have individual lawyers setting their rates, giving away time, writing off associate time left and right. Uh, let's be rigid and and uh, and and you know if you want to come off rate, we have an intake committee. You got to bring that before. Uh, we need good retainer agreements, good ret retention. You know, uh, you don't let the clients get ahead of you when it comes to getting paid. Uh, we also asked overall expectation for firm profitability next year compared to this, and uh, most firms pretty uh, optimistic. Six and ten projecting a moderate increase, and we didn't ask about overall firm profitability in dollars or profit per equity partner. We didn't drill it down that way, but just generally, I think firms are pretty optimistic about the year ahead. Yeah, if you um, go to the if you go two slides back, um, you don't go, but for the audience, if you want to check it later, you'll notice that the top end of this the is this, is the same sixty percent that's pursuing the higher rates. So to me, what that means is people who are doing that have a fairly high degree of confidence that they're going to get it. Again, for those of you who are struggling with this, that is a very clear message that none of us individually are providing to you. You're, you're seeing it from your own peers. And this is pretty much a live data set. So is there anything in absolute? No, but that's a pretty good indication that of what's going on out there in your peer law firms. And in terms of the data, this is the 115 law firm leaders that registered for today's program. Uh, this is where we collect this data. So it is timely and very current, and I think a pretty good sample size uh, of firms. Rob, you wanted to talk a little bit about rate strategy, you and Bill both here, and, and really honing in beyond the rate but achieving the rate, achieving the utilization, the billable hours uh, to really impact your bottom line here. Talk to us about realization and, and what we're seeing in this particular graph you asked us to uh, include in the program. Hey, Bill, why don't you start off? I'll wait till you get another sip of water there, but why don't you start it? Is that so, water? Is that water? Yeah, yeah, I take great okay. question. Okay. <laughs> On the grounds that it may incriminate me, I refuse to answer that question. Um, <laughs> Twenty. So this is. I wanted people to have a just a small hypothetical to, in case you don't have something like this. It's a very good exercise. It's very very simple. All it is is a this is a hypothetical firm from twenty one from twenty two to twenty three, and they pursued a five point eight percent increase in their average work rate. Okay, so maybe overall they pursued a a 7% increase across the board and they were they actually achieved the 5.8 so these are actual numbers so but that was it that translated into a 4.5% increase in their collected rate right so that's good right those are all good but you'll see from the few stats below it that their realization took a hit so right which again if you're going to be pretty aggressive on rate increases um you need to sort of anticipate that right now you still need to sort of understand the why peel that back but and that in the gap um, calculation is just another way of illustrating the realization hit okay so you're basically seeing that the really important part about doing this little hypothetical exercise for your firm is down below so if you just take one percent of the increase of the of the new average work rate, five, five, 5.88, 1% of that's $5.88. If you simply multiply that by you know the number of lawyers you have and the average hours they bill, you can see how very easily it reaches. So for 100 lawyers, 1,700 hours each, it's a million dollars. It's actually just shy of a million dollars, but it's basically a million dollars. That's how much of an impact so because one of the pushbacks you'll hear from attorneys right is that and and i and i apologize if i you you've all know this probably but when the pushback one of the reasons you get pushback is they're like it's i'm not going to be able to get that much i'm only going to be able to get a dollar rate change or whatever and it's not going to matter um, this math shows you how a few dollars makes a big difference Okay, when you're starting to talk about rates and the realization of those rates. So this yep. this math, right? So if you improved on your realization as well, these numbers even get bigger. So it's a very good model. If you don't have something like this, you should. And just, you know, put this out in front of your partners any chance you get. I think it's helpful. You know, I would contend that most equity partners of law firms, they're lawyers, not business people. And and the 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 
this notion of realization and how important it is to look beyond the hours, the rates, but collecting on those hours and and uh, being assertive on the rates, uh, contemporaneous timekeeping practices. It's amazing how much money firms leave on the table because they have sloppy uh, timekeeping practices and billing practices, capturing that time, getting the bills out, efficiency, so you do get paid, and the distance between the time the hour is worked and the time the hour is paid for, it's, it's a full, rate and we're feeding those 1800 hours to our associates and really hone in on that and help your equity partners appreciate and understand uh, how powerful this is and a little tweaks here and there can have powerful impacts to the bottom line rob anything uh yeah, i think this? i think bill did a great job summing up it's a um again um you have to have your procedures down your processes in place and um really Start with the beginning, be, uh, be aggressive on the rates where it makes sense, but more importantly, it's collecting that money and, um, you know, make sure you're getting in a timely fashion and people are putting their time. In. The, small, the small things matter. They make a they big really difference. They really do add yeah. up, don't they? I remember, I remember b before we jump, I remember being at a global firm and the, the global managing partner came and spoke to our office and he was out drumming beating his drum trying to get a one day reduction in the billing cycle, one day, anywhere in the cycle, because the math they did removing one day from the cycle was a million dollars to the bottom line of that firm, mm -hmm. wow. a million dollars a day. So you can imagine, right? If you could trim it by 5% or something, I mean, yeah. the numbers are staggering. So obviously it's all about scale, but it, it's, it matters. Well, it just something like if we could get each of our timekeepers to bill an additional hour every week, just one hour per week, and you extrapolate that, you know, huge yeah. impact on the bottom yeah. line, huge. And uh, these aren't big stretches, really. Uh, but being disciplined about the rates and getting the time in, getting the bills out, getting paid, really, really important. The top line. Uh, but Bob, your, or Rob, your company really looks at the bottom line and the expense side of profitability. So we've got the top line, the revenue coming in the door. Uh, let's look to uh, the issue of real estate and, and, and office space. And to set us up, we do have a polling question here. Let me get over to my polling. We, we just started voting in Georgia, by the way, yesterday. So uh, yeah, I, got, I, mean, I got my voting machine working here. And to set our conversation, we wanted to ask folks if they had a lease coming up uh, between now and the end of next year, uh, yes or no. And the answers will come on in here. And uh, Rob, what do you think? Most firms looking at uh, looking at expiring leases and uh, the, the space and the rates they're going to pay for that space? Well, I tell you, well, the numbers right there, 68% don't have a lease coming up by the end of next year, which is somewhat surprising. I'm surprised. Um, yeah. Um, the, you know, what you read uh, is that, again, the firms are still focused on that now. But then again, you see some some um, articles that say firms are taking more space. And Bill, what, what we talked about was a lot of times this is geographically based on how many people are coming back to the office and when they're coming back or if they're coming back or whatever. Um, which I thought was a great, you know, you had a lot of, you, you had a different viewpoint. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, one of the, one of the great things about this question, um, John, I think you might want to slide this over. We're, we're looking at a, a slide yep, deck. Or I see what you're looking at. I'm trying to, again, I'm oriented okay, no to worries. a new well, format. I will just, so. Rob and I will just keep talking. Yeah, so I'm the, uh, around, you guys fill the, uh, fill the space. <laughs> I'll just keep talking. The, um, so the, the, the reason why this is a good question though, is because um the world has changed with office space right and um the fact that actually rob i thought the number of people renewing in the next two years would be smaller because don't forget most leases are at least for five to ten years so yep. you pick out any any slice in time and it's usually not going to be that many renewing so that's a that's a pretty good number so this so i'm, I'm glad because I, this topic will hopefully resonate with that group so the point i wanted to make about this in general though is that 
you know, if you've done this for a while and you've been involved with lease renewals in the past, you know, a lot of it's pretty block and tackle, right? You do a little projecting about what our, our headcount might change, and then you simply extrapolate that into your office count, and then you figure out if you can refresh your space at all, and, and if you have to expand or retract or whatever. So it's, it's pretty block and tackle. But the problem is, is post-COVID, this exercise has dramatically changed. It's dramatically changed because now not often, not, not also do you need to understand those things like what's going to happen, are we going to hire, are we going to retract or whatever. We need to know how people are using the space. And, and even if they're using it, how are they using it? How often are they using it? Right? Because the answer to those questions all of a sudden changes what kind of space you need or want to make available to them. You know, the notions of standardized offices is becoming totally commonplace now. Partners don't need the palatial office anymore. If you're still pursuing that or you're not considering any of these other sort of hybrid oriented topics, you're, you're missing an opportunity to really streamline your use of space. And as your second largest expense, this is, this is not a topic to be, you know, kind of passed over lightly because it's huge. Um, so that's, I think it's one of the reasons why this is a very, very important and very timely topic for our audience with 30% renewing in two years. Let's throw up this question that uh, we wanted to ask our audience, and that speaks to uh, your policy around uh, return to office. So Rob, as we launch this polling question, set us up for, uh, you know, return to office considerations. Okay. <clears throat> Again, um, I think most firms are working in the hybrid environment and they're going to continue in the hybrid environment. Now, that's not saying that there are some firms in ge certain geographical areas have thrown that whole hybrid thing out the window and are demanding that people are back in the office five days a week. But I would say, you know, the majority of firms are still in this hybrid, well, 62%. Okay. So um I and I and again, Bill and I have gone back and forth on this. I think the toothpaste is out of the two. I think it's gonna stay this way. I think you got your partners working out of their, you know. Uh, beach houses and so on like that. And that's not going to change anytime soon. Now, granted, that, that creates a whole nother set of issues, mentoring and so on like that. But I, I think the hybrid is there. And I think firms, the smart firms are adapting to it and adapting to it to how they're delivering their administrative services and how they're handling their, the uh, real estate. All right, since, this is the, since this is a debate format, I'm going to be contrary to Rob on this one. Point or or counterpoint. Yeah, I'm going to give you some counterpoints that you can think about. So here's here's the way I look at this. First of all, I think the 21% at the bottom. Can you? Is it possible for you to leave that, John? Oh sure, sure, sure. Hang on, let me get back there. I'm sorry to make you jump around. I just think the numbers are important. But that, if, so, if you're in that percentage that that are below, that that basically we've always been in the office and never plan to change. I think you're from either cities that are smaller or southern cities. Like I know a lot of my friends in Texas said that very thing. They're like, we never went and we're, we're in and we've never left. So, you know, and there's plenty of firms around the country who have done the same. So I wasn't, I'm not surprised to see a pretty decent grouping there. Um, but you can see a bunch of already implemented return to office policies. So 15% have already seen the writing on the wall following AT&T and Dell and Google and all these other companies that are are realizing big hits to their performance and are saying enough's enough. So let me just talk about my sort of where I come at this is there's two main categories of issues that are going to force firms to go back to the office. The first are, are the external pressures, right? And, and I, cause I think our cities are, are going to have an all out press soon because they're seeing all of the ancillary businesses take a hit. Restaurants are closing gyms and health clubs are closing, right? All those types of things are taking a hit because of a lot of companies that have gone virtual or whatever, or have hybrid policies. Mass transit is taking a hit. And I think for those reasons, the, our metropolitan managers are going to want to get you back into the city. So there's a big pressure there. I also think 
Um, there was one other external pressure. I'll see if I think about it, but but that's a big one. The um, the other though are your internal pressures. So the thing you can't get away from is that when when you where regards to your support staff, it has become very difficult to manage them in a hybrid environment. Anybody who's doing this knows very well, right? You have a hard time tracking them. You don't know exactly what, you know, how productive they're being because we don't, we don't have the tools in place to sort of micromanage our people. And we don't really want to do that, but you're missing that. And the fact that you're missing that creates a very bit, a very a large amount of angst for those managers. And I'll tell you that. So, and they, they, anybody you'll talk to will reinforce that. The other though, is that you can't, you, it doesn't address the training and mentoring aspect for our attorneys. It's 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 very difficult to to do in a hybrid environment. It's very difficult to do remotely. I'm not. I don't mean a stereotype. I know some firms are having success in some of these areas, but the mo most firms are not, and they're kicking the can down the road and, because they don't want to fight the fight to get people back. But I'm seeing these big public companies. The cities are pushing. There's a big wave of that sort of external push to get people back to the office. And I think you have lots of internal pressures that are going to make you want to rethink this and, and just maybe ride the wave. Do yourself a favor, right? Don't be the outlier. You know, what, what, what I want to make sure we talk a little bit, you know, this hone in on profitability. We're really going to have firms are looking at profitability by client, by lawyer, by practice, by office. And our, if you ask firms to describe the culture, what's the culture we try to manifest? It's all about collegiality, uh, collaboration, family. And, you know, now we're going to hone in on profitability. There may be some tensions around that. Uh, but I think culture is really, really important. And building a culture that attracts and retains talent and where they have to go to work every day is an important factor. Uh, I have a client here in Atlanta who, who they're in a strong position to renegotiate their lease. They moved upstairs a floor and built just cool space with lots of group space, a break area. They have a refrigerator full of beer and people want to come into the office. They want to be there because it's fun. It's cool. Stuff's happening. It's in a great location with an amenity rich environment. Lots going on. A hip place, part of town. Uh, so it's really interesting. The hoteling, you know, we're certainly seeing more of that downsizing. Uh, occasionally, you still run into a law library, though. <laughs> occasionally, you still see a law library. But uh, yeah, it's be intentional, deliberate about your office space. Number two, expense item. A lot of firms I see, I'm sure you guys do too, the three-day uh, flex and an anchor day, an anchor day. Young people seem to want the flexibility. They expect the flexibility, and some of them will quit if you don't afford them flexibility. So just I, I, stuff to think about. Yeah, I, I tell you, just to, I'm going to tell you, and this is the area that we spend I, I tell you, one third of our practice is on helping firms reshape their administrative services to service this hybrid work environment. And Bill, there are tools. You know, again, we're unbiased, but you know, Big Hands, uh, excellent tool, service now that can track the utilization of what these people are doing in a remote location, and it gives the attorneys or the submitting party full knowledge of where their where their project's at at any time till they get it back. So the tools are out there to measure what people are doing. Um, I tell you, you talked about the offices and the cities and mass transit, they've already taken a hit. We're, we're th you know, I tell you, uh, four years removed from COVID, three years removed. So they're, they're gone already, you know what I'm saying? I just think it just affords firms to operate much more cost effectively their, their talent, instead of recruiting in certain geographic areas, you're wide open. You can go anywhere in the nation and get talent, anywhere in the world. And that's what firms are doing. And it's a, a much more cost-effective delivery, service delivery model. And I, I think there are ways to track it. There are ways to manage it. And the attorneys coming out now from law school or the young associates are much more self-sufficient than the attorneys who have been in 
you know, practicing for the past 30, 40 years, uh, you know, yeah, I'm not trying to uh, age uh, uh, stereotype here, but yeah, there's, um, there's, so I think it's for the right firm. Again, there are some challenges in mentoring, but I think it's a wide open um, uh, environment to really examine how you're delivering services and reduce your number two expense, real estate, and attack your labor dollars and reduce them. So again, all the negatives I understand, but you know, there's a lot of positives and there's ways to manage it if it's done right. And that's kind of whether you do it in-house or you outsource it, what, which a lot of firms are looking at. Yeah. So you have a lot of firms are going to need, would need help with, with that. There's a lot of moving parts. Yes. Yeah. It's a, it's a big, big consideration, obviously. And, uh, you know, being intentional, being deliberate about what you're doing, why you're doing it, uh, being intentional. I think is really, really important. You don't have this department doing it one way, the next department doing it another way. Uh, the Boston office does it a different way and it's very random. And, uh, you know, just being consistent, intentional uh, about uh, office, in office expectations. Um, let's move over to people strategy here and um, talk to us about this a little bit. Okay, well, I tell you, kind of just piggybacking on our conversation on the administrative services is really um, there's a large opportunity, huge opportunity for firms to take a look at how they're delivering administrative services. And a lot of larger firms have already done this and outsourced certain aspects to third parties domestically and internationally. And if it's done right and implemented well and the change management aspect is addressed. It, it's a it's a powerful tool. Okay, you know, eighty three percent of lawyers right now work outside of normal business hours. Okay, how do they get their work done? Okay, they, you know, they they submit it into a job tool. It flows to one of these backup uh, audios, uh backup facilities and gets done overnight, and it's sitting on their desk in the morning. So really, yeah, uh, you know, we. The way we attack a project like this is getting a grip on what people are doing now on a day-to-day -day basis and put putting a cost to that. So great time for that it's question. Interesting. When COVID hit, the big concern was loss of productivity. People are going to goof off working at home. We're going to lose productivity. We're going to lose productivity. It didn't happen. Uh, you know, we routinely asked, are you losing productivity? And the productive people are as productive as they could be at home. No, no commute, no disturbances. Uh, the, the chronic underperformers, you know, they, they chronic underperform as well. But uh, this fear of nobody's working if I can't see them in the cubicle, I don't know. It's largely unfounded. You hire good professional people with strong exactly. work ethic, let them go. Uh, let them manage themselves. Um, as Rob says, a lot of these young lawyers are very independent, very self-sufficient. But that culture, that culture, that collaboration, sharing, teamwork, it is hard to achieve remotely. Uh, Biggest challenge. Yeah. And the anchor, the anchor days, you know, I uh, seem to be very common uh, among the smaller and mid-sized firms. Wednesdays are anchor day. That's when everybody's coming in. We're going to have the lunch, have the group meetings and such. And then beyond that, we'll offer you some flexibility because uh, the young people more and more uh, are demanding it, not just asking for it, demanding it. And I think they'll walk on you. Uh, there are other firms that will entertain the remote situation. Absolutely. And pay as much, if not more, in compensation. Right. So uh, that's a pretty attractive option to young lawyers wanting to start families. Uh, okay. John, what the answers you're seeing here on the screen is exactly what yes. we see out in the marketplace. Yep. Everyone, you know, very, very, um, and I'm shocked that the 21% know um, they closely That's monitor high. the utilization. Yeah. That seems high, high to me too, yeah. Okay. Most don't have, uh, are either, they have some idea or they have no idea. And well, quite frankly, it. you know, having been in legal management for my entire life, it seems like most firms, live in the middle right they they yeah. they have a and if you ask anybody like well how how is this department run or how are they efficient or are they productive or are they I mean, like well, we have a generally good idea that they're x i mean and and that's and that's how we manage because we don't have data 
We don't have details. We don't have accountability. We just don't have systems like that. So one of the things Rob and I wanted to show you, which I think is the next slide, was that there, there are tools out there that if you don't, if you don't want to put in some uh, monitoring system that logs every single job and things like that, there are ways of, of assessing and surveying your, your firm where you can still paint that picture of how people are spending their time. It doesn't, you know, things that, that we've used don't always address the productivity issue, but I also think it's a misnomer to jump and, and address productivity before you actually even know how people are spending their time. You know, whether they're productive with those hours is a, is a separate and secondary question to how are they spending the hours initially. Um, so so this is a, this what you're seeing on the screen right here is a, is a quick snapshot of us of a tool that we use that provides you that. This is actually, you know, a, a P, it's a very, it's a snippet, but it's a piece of a survey that an employee would complete. And you can actually see that we know when they complete it, we know how many hours they spend doing, a, a, you know, any task that we occur that occurs in a law firm, and then we correlate it to their compensation. So you can see what they're doing, how much of it they're doing, and what it costs you to have them do it. Because that's so this might be a legal uh, assistant. Um, yeah, or a secretary, somebody like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you can really break down where the time's being spent and uh... exactly. So once you know this, like for example, you can see the 30 at the top bar, 30% of this person's time is spent on word processing. Now the question is, is are they good at that? Are they proficient? Are they productive or whatever? Separate question, but at least when you go to manage this individual, you know that when you're speaking about those types of activities, you're speaking about 30% of their time is allocated towards that. And if you wanted to re-engineer positions, you've also got the data in front of you to re-engineer it. So if you took word processing away from this person, because maybe they weren't very proficient at it, you've got 30% of them to reallocate something else too. Or, so you know, Bill, different. how would this time be captured? Does the individual have to time track or is this done through various kind of behind the scenes time yeah, it's, tracking? It, it's a, no, it feels like a survey. It's basically a questionnaire that each employee completes. It's a gotcha. very unique questionnaire. Rob and I are happy to show it to anybody who wants to see it, but it's a very unique questionnaire that's kind of built specifically for the challenges in the legal world. But that's what it does. It basically creates this profile for each person, and then you can manage that person. You can manage the department they're in because you can see all the members of that department or any any breakdown you would like to see. This yeah. is self-reported by the individual, however. Correct. I mean, right. Is there any fact-checking there? Well, I tell you, what we do is focus groups with the attorneys and we have them look at the uh, percentage of time that their um, legal secretaries are spending and does that seem right to them? Okay, so that's kind of one way we fact uh, uh, we check it. But really what we do is then take this information and hey, if on average, you if you have, you know, 25 legal admins, and they're all spending 30% of their time on document processing, does it make sense to pull that and outsource that function, mm -hmm. okay? Or create your own in-house document processing, okay? And free up 30% of their time, which means, hey, if you can't fill with other activities, do you still need as many legal administrative assistance? Well, let, let's pause and talk about AI, which can do a lot of word processing a lot of document management, document review. What, what do you forecast to be the impact of AI on the profession, uh, on our need for support staff, and, and, and second, third year associates for that matter? I think, I'm take, I'm trying, I'm well, go ahead though, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, the way, the way I view that is, you know, when, you, when you're seeking to make improvements, right of any of any department and productivity is you're you're going to look at the three pillars right people process and technology so what all you're talking about with ai is you're introducing a new technology into the equation just like we did when we you know rolled out a new version of word or you know moved from the wang word processing mainframes right okay i'm going way back if we're showing our age bill you know, i don't look this old but i'm telling you i'm old anyway um, but so, so that's what it is. So AI is absolutely a factor, 
but I wouldn't look at it as some panacea. It's it is an element of change that's coming as and you know as changes always have, and you definitely need to weigh it in into the weave it into the equation. But it is it is a it is, a, it is an ingredient. It is not a panacea. Um, is again a personal opinion, and Rob will probably yell at me about this too. But anyway. Yeah, I, I, I like it when Rob yells. Yeah. <laughs> Let it loose, Rob. What are you doing? Um, I tell you, everything. I, I agree. Everything that Bill's saying. Um, and there's a part coming. Yeah, well, I, no, I'm, I'm feeling saying, something's coming. <laughs> it's it's coming. Okay. If I go into a law firm now and say, "Listen, you could cut," you know, we could outsource this and introduce AI and stuff. I wouldn't get AI out of my mouth before someone threw something at me. It, it, it's not ready yet, okay? And they say, okay, you know, it, it's coming, no doubt about it. We gotta have our finger on the pulse, but it's not there yet to solve it. Will it be there? Absolutely, at some point, but that's one year, three years. But right now, for the average firm to embrace that and count on that, reducing headcount or whatever, it could supplement, it could be a tool, but it's not there yet. To be a game changer, I think it will be absolutely. So. You know, we we've been doing this these AI programs, and we we have one lady who comes, and she's very public about it, and she runs an immigration law boutique in upstate New York. She's got about fifteen lawyers. It's a very document intensive practice, federal practice, and she is embracing AI and incorporated into their uh, workflows, and gone from I believe eight paralegals down to two already and uh, expects more uh, staff eliminations as they learn how to use this for their practice. It's, it is right. immigration document intensive, very form intensive. Uh, it's really interesting, this AI thing and the implications it has for billable hours and uh, how we price our services. Um, I think, you know, we encourage folks, jump in the pool, play around with it, learn how to use it responsibly and ethically. Uh, last week in Chicago, this struck me. One lady, we had a women's conference, all women uh, from all over the country, Canada, and we were talking about this topic. And one lady shares, we just got a proposal from our largest client. And within it is language that we are not to use AI generated material on any of their matters. They're banning us from using AI on their files. Lady right smack dab next to her says, Funny, we just got a similar uh, uh, you know retention with our top client who's insisting that we do use AI and apply it to their matters. So, you know, we're all trying to figure it out. I think there's a big opportunity here for smaller mid-sized firms to get ahead and, and really learn how to use it. I think you will really leap to the, the forefront here. Uh, how long are you gonna wait before you switch off uh, you know, uh, Wang computers and, and go to go to a desktop <laughs> setting. Uh, the, there's still firms that have fax machines lurking around somewhere. And remember when those first came out? Oh my God. Uh, so yeah, I think out, I think every all all the professionals in the industry need to constantly be maintaining their technology proficiency. And because I talk to kids, I mentor a lot of kids who are in like sophomores in college, juniors in college, and they they scare me sometimes how non-technically oriented they are. And, and I'm like, I saw how, how influential technology was to my generation. Now we're on the way out, but it, it's only gonna influ influence you more, exactly. And, I mean, and, and to tell me that you're like, well, I don't have any real interest in computers. I don't, I don't see, I'm, you, so when I, so just thinking about our audience, for those of you who you know are not scheduled to retire in the next year or so, like you you need to be paying attention to staying current with your technology proficiency. Period. Um, it needs to be an important element. There's no doubt. Yep. Uh, Rob, here's another uh, survey example. Anything you want to highlight here uh, that you think folks should know about? Really, just a bigger, uh, a larger number, okay, a larger amount of users um, of the same thing that we showed you before. What percentage of the, how many hours is a firm spending and what's that costing the firm? And is there better ways to do it? Okay. 
And that's where, again, we come in to either help you improve that in-house and create departments in-house, or if you want to outsource it. So again, it's just a different view of what we just showed you, but um, mm -hmm. um, I really exactly what comes out of the survey tool that Bill and I spoke about. I notice, uh, Rob, you don't have real estate in, in this in this example. We don't have. Well, well I take. Well, go ahead, Bill. They're not. These aren't legal categories. These are categories of activities. Okay. That this is time. Perform. Time. Right. Basically, Correct. then, right? Yes. Okay, got it. So the business development uh, number four on the list here is this staff, uh, you know, or is this uh, lawyer time invested in business development? Yeah, I believe this sample came from a firm that was included both. This is the, okay. this is all personnel at the firm who completed the survey. And you can tell that by the average hourly cost to the there firm. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the one thirty-two that, here. That's yeah. probably got some lawyer marketing time in it, huh? Yeah, versus support. the admins to support, which is at 45. Right. Exactly. Right. Gotcha. A lot of guys like John Rumson. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no clients, no law firm. Uh, people strategy. Anything else uh, about the people side of the firm before we move to the expenses and nope. talk a little bit about expense strategies? I, I nope. just think it's, again, your top one, your, tell you, top two expenses, top three. Um, I tell you, you're, you're crazy not to take a look at it and make sure you're not utilizing in the most cost-effective, efficient way. Yep. And that doesn't mean just chopping headcount. You got to do it strategically, which leads uh, to the expenses. Yeah. And here's our, but you know, I, you know, we look at a secretary or a secretary, listen to me, administrative assistant, paralegal. Often we've got an equity partner, very protective of that individual, you know, a long time employee. And, you know, it's, it's hard sometimes to really get in there and measure profitability and, and, you know, there could be some tensions, disruptions along with it, but be thoughtful and deliberate about what you're doing. Let's move to our final uh, segment. And that's about uh, expense strategy. And we, wanted to ask our audience this question and then we'll have uh, Rob and, and uh, Bill talk a little bit which is uh, the frequency with which your firms examines uh, its administrative and office services uh, Rob what do you think we're gonna see here uh, I think you're gonna see I tell you the occasionally being the biggest number okay I it's in uh, I think it's excellent that firms are looking at constantly, but I don't think firms do it enough, big or small. Bill? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think the folks who do it constantly, you know, are the fortunate ones who have people that can, that have time to be dedicated to it. So I think that's good. Um, I don't, I don't know that it should need, you know, but expenses is a pretty broad category, so they might be thinking about something in particular. Um, but um, you, you know, something like like a big bill, like legal research services, for example, is a big bill and it comes in every month. So you firms generally kind of want to pay attention to that number. But uh, but I anyway, I agree with Rob. I mean, obviously, expenses. You know, anybody when you when they if you ask a kind of a, a real veteran managing partner you know, how to achieve greater profitability to firm, they likely will not talk about expenses. They'll talk about revenue, right? They'll talk about the other side of the balance sheet. And so, and and while I I get that, and and I do think there's there's relevance to that, I I think there's a big opportunity on the expense side. It's but it's not, you know, finding a better vendor for paper clips. It's 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 really looking at your expenses strategically and really understanding how how you're allocating your resources. And, and again, just to kind of dovetail back to our previous conversation that maybe Rob was gonna do this, but the, you know, compensation's your number one expense. And so you can't ignore not only the amount of dollars you're spending for the, your, your staff that aren't attorneys, intentionally avoiding the non-word, John, uh, you don't want to, we don't want to use I don't the like the non. We're not you non. Know that. Yeah, we're we not know non. that. Non-lawyer, non-attorney, non-billable. So, I don't like so the you have that. Non. So you have that bucket of expense of all those people who are not lawyers providing other valuable services to the firm. But don't forget, when you think about admin activities, business development, finance, billing, all those types of things, our lawyers are involved in a lot of them. 
hiring, recruiting, interviewing, right? So they spend a lot of administrative hours also. So when you think about what we're, what firms are spending on administrative stuff generally, I'm telling you, it's north, what, you know, you might think in your head, it's 50, 50, mm -hmm. half on, mm -hmm. it's not, it's 80, 20 or 70, 30. We spend a lion's share of our time on administrative activities as a whole, as an organization. Bill is there a really good benchmarking study out there for smaller and mid-sized law firms that breaks down the major components of expense just you know marketing technology office space salaries uh, insurance all these big things is there a really good benchmarking survey I i'm having trouble finding a really good one specific yeah. to smaller and mid-sized firms i i don't i don't know i mean it, the, and here's your challenge is you know, we all know the challenges. We, we're dealing in an industry that are all private organizations. So a lot of them are not, you know, real open about what's going on inside their firms, which is a, a problem, right? We should probably talk about ways of challenging that, but that's a whole nother webinar. But, but so you have that is go, going on, but you also have the diversity of firms, right? Which works against you here because geographic diversity, practice diversity and things like that, it's, it's going to really move those numbers all around. So, but I do think if you got to a number that is a little bit of a special number, like a percentage of comp, you know, that's averaged or something and, and you know, you get to sort of a per hourly, you know, component or something, something comparative, you might be able to, you know, normalize the data to get it realized. But no, I don't know anybody who's doing that. It's very difficult. Yeah, Some I'm, of the I'm, if you find it, let me know. Or we yeah, should build. It. Doing, we should build. It uh, surveys, I'm sorry to cut you. Off. Rob and I are doing surveys that help the firm see what their number is, and they can understand themselves. And and people always ask, like, well, how does this compare to another firm? And it's it's just always difficult to provide that. But it's good to know your number at least. So, yeah, we're, we're getting there. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. You know, I was going to ask you, do you do you uh, source a really good benchmarking survey for smaller mid-sized law firms? Uh, not yet. We do have a lot of benchmarks, but mostly for larger firms on uh, costs in certain areas, you know, offsite record storage, you know, legal research, um, administrative services side, as we talked about. Um, but really, I, I hear you. It would be great to have a great benchmark, but I think just putting practices in place We'll make sure that you are um, you're you're managing your expenses well. And a lot of times, the people who are managing the expenses don't really have the experience, or they just kind of were given that as part of their responsibilities of um, moving up through the firm. But really, just simple things like getting competitive proposals. You know, when your copier contracts up, or your printers, or whatever, or, or legal research, um, just getting a competitive. Another big area is offsite record storage. And there, it's just the contract terms. Yep. Knowing what contract terms. And we have tons of information on our website over what are the terms you should have in your agreements to protect it. And a lot of people ignore those and they end up getting bit at some point down the road. So there are the two things. I know we're kind of running out of time here, but just trying to keep things, first of all, do it strategically. Just don't cut costs for the sake of cutting costs. Make sure you get competitive pricing. Um, try to get some benchmarks if you can. Again, we're, we're happy to supply it where we have it. And then uh, taking a look at the terms. You know, I often said, you know, the big firm, big laws well served. There's plenty of surveys out there. Citibank, Wells Fargo, Deloitte, plenty of them. But the smaller and mid-sized firms, where do they go to find that benchmarking data? And I agree with everything you say. It's very hard to find. There's so many variables, geography, firm size, type of practice. Uh, it's hard to find. You know, for years we'd said marketing is two to five percent. Well, that's a wide range. Two to five percent of gross revenue is what a firm should be spending on marketing and business development. Well, what do you count as part of marketing and business development? I mean, do you count CLE conferences and such, bar association activities? I mean, it, it's it's hard to get those apples to apples numbers that so many people are looking for. A firm like ours in Cleveland with a similar practice. I mean. Where do you find that? Uh, it is elusive. Uh, Sounds uh, like another, try project. To provide... another project. Another project for us, Rob. 
Yeah, yep. one more thing to add to the list. So we like to dispense. I'm looking at the time, but uh, you know, just like to offer some guidance to managing partners and you know, profitability and really honing in on your top line, your rates, your dollars, your realization, timekeeping practices, and the tensions that finding that balance between the collaborative culture where everyone gets along, kumbaya, and we're really honing in on profitability uh, can create tensions. KPIs, I think we agree realization is a really, really good one to keep an eye on. Uh, realization rate by timekeeper. Uh, we, we all look at the hours, collections, origination. I think good KPIs to look at might be client satisfaction. We tend to think of financial KPIs, but client satisfaction, employee satisfaction, you know, happy people tend to be more productive, more loyal, uh, and may help with your retention. Uh, the hourly rate schedule we all talked about, you know, get get that in place and anyone comes off it needs needs some permission from someone, uh, you know, within the firm, an intake committee, managing partner, uh, and get that lease. If it's coming up, it sneaks up on you fast and don't wait till six months out uh, to start shopping for space and putting your landlord on notice. Anything guidance you guys might offer today's listeners? that's not on this list you'd like them to take away from our conversation you know one of the yeah. best i'm sorry rob just thinking about um client surveys another another way to attack that because i think a lot of firms are pensive about those activities but we did a report at a, a firm i was at where we basically measured total revenue by client and a lot of firms have that it's a, usually a canned report but chart that out and what yep. you do is you watch the progression year over year. So, and if you wanna know what your clients are thinking, you don't need to look any further than that report because if somebody's number is going down, you need to ask the question internally. What's going on? Why, yeah. Why? Okay, yeah. why is this number going down? If it's going up, right, It's you You wanna know that answer too and get that, but it, it's that's a, a fantastic tool that any administrative team should be able to produce and just visualizing out those trends um, and having using that at a partner retreat or something is an yeah, absolutely fantastic stuff. exercise. Great point. And, you know, breaking it down by industry, you know, within, you know, if you're representing a lot of car dealerships, a lot of banks, a lot of real estate developers, and it's an interesting analysis. And uh, uh, yeah, when there's a precipitous decline in revenue from a client getting in there, and and I would say further, Bill, you you can go no farther than your page one clients. That's probably going to capture eighty percent of your revenue. Just those eight those page one clients uh, that are really providing you know eighty nine you know eighty or ninety percent of your firm's revenue. Your top twenty in most yeah. cases. Uh, Rob, anything you might add to our, our list of guidance to uh, managing partners? I, I tell you, they say you can either raise the bridge or lower the water. You know, we talk a lot about raising the bridge on rates and okay, yes. realization. Um, you know, and we talked about lowering the water with expense management. I, I, I think a two prong approach, focusing on those, um, will you know, again, pushing the rates where you can, it's going to leave you in pretty good shape. I, I'm picturing a sailboat approaching a, uh, a, a non, you know, opening bridge and how are we going to get through? <laughs> We're going to lift the bridge or, or roll through at low tide. Uh, that's the image I have. And it's a good one. It's a good one. And it is a multi-pronged approach for sure. The top line, the bottom line, uh, what's left is, is profits for the partners. Uh, Rob, thank you so much for joining us. Bill, good to see you as well. And uh, both of these gentlemen are available. If you'd like to carry on the conversation, toss an email, make a phone call. Uh, they'd love to hear from you, so don't hesitate to pick up the phone. Uh, we'll be following up uh, with the recording and handout material, uh, our benchmarking data, so to speak, that we collected this afternoon. Always happy to share it, pass it along to our listeners. So Bill, Rob, thank you so much. Thank you. And um, thank you. good to be with you. And thank you for attending, everyone. We'll see you next uh, next month. Take care. Bye now.